this is the last thing that we have planned for the school. So therefore it is the best. <laughs> That's how it works. Um, basically what we have for you is some uh, additional hands-on things that we have put together. This is part of um, a deep learning at scale tutorial that uh, we've been doing at a number of conference venues. I think Prabhat had mentioned that we do this. Torsten's lecture earlier is, is a big part of that. So that and these hands-on things, these examples that we have here kind of make up the meat of that tutorial. Um, so I do have just a few set of slides that I usually show. It's kind of just an introduction to the, the code and what it's gonna do. Um, we have, um, and, and unlike, the, unlike the tutorial examples from earlier in this week where we were just lazy and we just took those from TensorFlow, this we actually did prepare ourselves. It's not using Jupyter Notebooks, um, but it has um, kind of a, a code base. You can submit things on, from, the, from the terminal. And um, we have a reservation on Cori, so you're gonna be able to, uh, to run things, but there will be some peculiarities, some, some specific things that you need to keep in mind. We're not gonna do these on GPUs, we're gonna do them on our CPU nodes. So if you're going through Jupyter, you gotta make sure you're not landing on a GP, GPU node. So back when you had those two buttons, you know, you'll wanna go back to that and use the, the CPU one. Um, but yeah, let me just get through some, some slides first. Um, and then you'll have some time to play with things. The school ends at two. Uh, should be enough time for you at least run something simple on some number of nodes on Cori. Um, you can also do other things. If you don't wanna do this hands-on, of course, you can go back and do some of the other notebooks from the week. I mean, there's more stuff that we've heard that actually was relevant to some of the examples since the last time you had a chance to do hands-on. Um, I will also call out that if you're interested in the hyperparameter optimization stuff that Ben had talked about earlier this week, um, you can come talk to him and um, he can help you. I think he can help you get an example that you can run and uh, that's another, another option for you. Okay, so uh, distributed training hands-on. <clears throat> uh, so we've seen a handful of these really kind of simple data sets that are open and popular for benchmarking. This is yet another one. I don't think you've played with SciFAR 10 yet, but um, in this hands-on what we're going to do we're gonna use a convolutional neural network model. We're just gonna do image classification. You've seen this already. Um, but we're gonna show you kind of how to do distributed training. So we're gonna use a ResNet architecture. Um, ResNet was mentioned earlier in the week, but now you can actually look at some code and um, uh, play with it. You can run it yourself on this SciFAR 10 data set. So um, sort of like, it's not too different from MNIST if you take a look at this. So. It has some natural kind of image things, these classes like airplane, cat, dog, et cetera. Only 10 classes, fairly small images. RGB, that's one thing a little more complicated than MNIST, which is only single channel, uh, grayscale, right? So now these have uh, three color channels, slightly bigger, and then the number of samples is basically the same as MNIST. <clears throat> so this data set and this problem doesn't really require large scale. You don't need a supercomputer to train a classifier to, to work on these images at all. Um, but this is something that, you know, we'll be able to kind of uh, run something in a reasonable time. So if, if you try to scale this up to, you know, whatever, hundreds of nodes, you might not even get a good result because it just doesn't scale that well. Um, but this will give you the kind of the tools, the sense for how you can uh, apply this to your own science problems. <clears throat> And at least if you take ResNet on SciFAR 10, if you run it single node, you'll see how slow it is. And then you can go to, you know, eight nodes or even a little, even a bit higher than that, you can go and you can still converge to a good result in faster time. So it's at least um, a good enough example uh, for that. So we're gonna use Keras. We've been using Keras throughout the week. And again, that's because it's the easiest to use and teach. So we're gonna keep using that. And we're gonna use Horovod, which equivalently is the easiest code to teach to do distributed data parallel training. Um, there are other options, but that's just the one with the fewest lines of code you have to change. Torsten mentioned Horovod uh, earlier. I'm not gonna go through very many details, um, but um, just a, a sort of recap, a high level recap. So Horovod, it's this um, library produced by Uber. Uh, it's named after this kind of um, Russian dance where you dance in a ring. 
Um, that's because you have these kind of ring-based all reduce uh, communications. Um, so Harvard enables distributed synchronous data parallel training with minimal changes to user code. So um, just to refresh from what Torsen was talking about, what this means to synchronous data parallel training. So we have some number of, of workers, let's say across different nodes of a system. Uh, each one has a, um, the same version of a model, the same set of weights and architecture. And as we're sampling mini batches of data and stochastic gradient descent, we're sort of distributing these mini batches across those workers. So uh, each worker would have a different subset of the overall mini batch. They process a mini batch um, in parallel. And then there's an all reduce that happens to kind of collectively kind of combine the gradients to get the overall gradient. And then every worker can do the same update to their model parameters. So that's the synchronous data parallel training. It's the most common way to parallelize and speed up the training of neural networks. Um, yeah, so just then one thing, I think, I think Torsen probably mentioned where this kind of comes from, but using all reduce and MPI has been, you know, common in, in, in HPC since forever. Um, but when people first started doing distributed training of neural networks like TensorFlow, they were focusing more on this parameter server based approach where all the workers send their updates to one special process called a parameter server and then it computes the updates and sends everything back. And this just sort of, um, this, this plot that Uber shows basically just um, kind of highlights that that's a potential bottleneck and can limit scalability. So these kinds of MPI based approaches or all reduced based approaches are, are really what's uh, popular now. Uh, so this example code that we have isn't going to show you all the really fancy cutting edge stuff that Torsten talked about when you really need to go huge scale and how to solve all these large scale convergence issues, batch size, you know, adaptive batch size, that kind of stuff. We don't have any of that, but we have basically here the, um, the basic stuff which um, can work for reasonable scales for a large number of problems and people. Okay, so what we use specifically is, um, so again, synchronous data parallel training, um, and here weak scaling, which what we mean by weak scaling here is weak scaling of the batch size. So uh, let's say you have a single node batch size of 32 or something. As, as we want to scale up to multiple nodes, um, when we say weak scaling, we mean we're keeping that local batch size to be that fixed number, so 32. But if I have 10 nodes now doing computation, the global actual batch size is 32 times 10. Um, yep, so using Horovod, we're going to use this linear, um, uh, the learning rate warm up. So um, I guess I forget to always change the order of these bullets. Let me see the learning rate scaling first. So we're also going to do this linear learning rate scaling. So if I have 10 workers, I want to try and do 10 times the learning rate. So I'm processing 10 times as much work. I want to try and take 10 times as large of a step size. Uh, that's how I can hopefully converge as fast as possible, right? So in scaling, always you're trying to push up the batch size so you can have more work to parallelize. And then um, correspondingly, you want to take larger steps in optimization. If you're using more data to take the same step size, you're not necessarily going to get to an optimum any faster. You're just wasting more computation. So always the goal is to maximize both of these things, batch size and learning rate. So we're gonna do the linear rate. So again, 10 workers, it'd be 10 times whatever learning rate you had for a single mode. Um, and then we have learning the linear warm up of the learning rate. So uh, it was shown that starting with a really large learning rate right at the beginning can be bad. Uh, it's better to start with a small learning rate and then ramp up to your large one. So to kind of get out of the whatever crazy space and the loss, uh, the loss space that you, that you start out with. Okay, so that's what the code is gonna do for you. Um, this just gives you a, you know, the, the kind of minimal description of what you need to do to enable data parallel training with Horovod in your code. So you have a training script that runs on a single node. Now you want to go multi-node. Uh, you basically just need these few things uh, with some additional um, small caveats. So um, it's basically an MPI application. So you need some sort of initialization at the beginning. So you're going to have some Horovod in it. Uh, that's going to do the rendezvous between all the workers so they're ready to communicate. Um, you're going to have an optimizer from, let's say, Keras, like SGD in this case, Stochastic Gradient Descent Optimizer. Does this thing still work? Yeah. Um, but now to do this in a data parallel fashion, all you really have to do is wrap it in this 
uh, class provided by Hormod, this distributed optimizer. Very, very simple. Um, and then one other thing you do is you add a callback to Keras that does the synchronization at the very beginning before training to make sure all the workers have the same model at the start, okay? So you don't do that synchronization later. All you do is you synchronize all the weights at the very beginning, and then through training, you're just doing the all reduce on the gradients. So that ensures that every worker is doing the same update, therefore always having the same model, the same set of parameters in the model. Um, yeah, then that's mostly it. I mean, you gotta pop, pass your callbacks into the model.fit function like you've done, you've used uh, this before, and you, know, you probably had some examples where you had callbacks. Um, and then you wanna launch the script with MPI. So you wanna say, I wanna launch 10 ranks, 10 workers uh, to do this in parallel. And we're on Cori, so we're gonna use Slurm. So you just submit that with SRUN and it's gonna work. <clears throat> okay, so we have a separate repository for, for these examples. It's here. These slides were sent, I, I, I linked these slides on the Slack, but also on the agenda is the link to these slides. Through that, you can come to this slide and you can click the link to the repository. <clears throat> um, or you can just navigate to GitHub, Nurse can find it that way. Um, so we have a reservation, as I said, so you can try the example out on Cori. Um, I'll, I'll walk you through it briefly, but um, uh, you can use Jupyter. You can actually also just use your training account and SSH to Cori if you want. Um, I don't know if I have the exact command in the, um, in the readme, but um, if you sort of already know how to SSH, then you probably know how to do that, or we can help you. Um, but we encourage you to use Jupyter, but we're not gonna actually run notebooks. We're gonna use Jupyter just to get a terminal, okay? So you'll open Jupyter, you, you'll, you'll make sure that you start uh, your Jupyter server on a CPU node, the shared CPU node, right? That's the other button. We previously used the GPU button. And then like we did for the other examples, we're gonna do a git clone of the repository and then just gonna work through the, the instructions that are in the readme. <clears throat> so uh, I think what it's gonna do is gonna suggest you can run on a single node to get a feel for how slow it is, and then you can run on eight or, you know, uh, you, can, you can probably do more, um, but I suggest you start with eight um, uh, nodes, do training, and then see, oh, it's faster and it's still converging to a good result. Um, and then after that, there are kind of a lot of things you can play with. So you can try to go in there and change the optimizer that's used, you can change the initial learning rate. You can change kind of how it's scaled. You can change the, the amount of epochs used for the, the learning rate warm up, um, how uh, the learning rate is decayed, uh, the scaling. So actually just via the configuration file, you can do linear learning rate scaling or you can do that square root scaling that Thorsten mentioned. <clears throat> um, and then the, the basically the, the conclusion or the takeaway is that with this example, with the configuration, as you scale up in nodes, you do see training time go down but the losses still converge the same way. So basically, if we look at 32 here, we're getting through 32 epochs much faster when we're running on um, you know, like 32 nodes, but um, we're still getting the same results. So basically we're getting, uh, we're getting to our answer much, much faster. So that's good, that's the kind of regime that you wanna be in. Question. Uh, this one doesn't scale perfectly. Ideally, you would have that um, linear scaling and um, yeah, there, there are some particular issues why this code base is, is not perfectly scaling, but it's, um, it's not too bad, okay. So th there can be some performance hits, for example, because we're using um, Keras here and it's not today the most optimal, but um, yeah, if you, if, you know, if you really push on things to use maybe sort of lower level TensorFlow and, and um, uh, kind of work on improving the, the, I'll do some optimizations. There's no reason why you can't get real, basically linear scaling up to 32. That should be easy. Um, yeah, but if you really wanna go up to like thousands of nodes like Torsten showed, you, you tend to have to do some additional tricks. Okay, so that's, uh, that's all there is for the slides. Let me just show you a little bit here. So this is what the repository looks like. Hopefully you're all there already. Um, Sort of like the other repository, I've set it up so there's some links that should be the right link to go to Jupyter using the same Jupyter URL. I already got kicked out. So now we can see this uh, GPU node is what we used before. Don't click that one. <laughs> CPU node is what we want today. So if you use GPU node, probably you just won't be able to submit the jobs. Probably, I, I think what will happen is when you try to do the S batch, it'll just say it can't do it because you're in like a different kind of slurm, a whole different um, setup for the system. 
Um, but the CPU node, so this is going to be on a shared node. So there will be other people on the node. We're not going to run extensive computation on that node. We're just using Jupyter to launch our work to the Cori batch system. Okay. Uh, yeah, so again, when you click this, you're not going to see so many kernels and things, but <clears throat> that's what I have. You'll start the terminal like we did before, and we'll clone the repository. So again, I have the nice thing here you can just copy paste unless you're one of these four people with the Windows laptop or some other browser that you can't <laughs> copy paste into Jupyter Lab. Uh, sorry, it's a miserable life you lead. Um, <clears throat> we get clone. You don't have to use Jupyter. Yeah, so you, if you're on Windows and you have PuTTY, you can just use SSH. Because again, we're only using Jupyter here to um, basically get a terminal. Um, well, and the, the file browser thing is kind of nice, right? So now I see it over here. I can actually look at the repository. And now I've got the uh, scaling tutorial. Okay, so I've got everything in here. Now, if you look at the instructions, um, I do sort of describe a bit the contents of the repository. So um, an additional takeaway you might get from this is it kind of gives you an example of how you can set up a project, a code base for doing deep learning with Keras like this. How is this is, I mean, you don't have to do it this way, obviously, but this is like um, an example of how you can structure things, how you can have um, directories and configuration files that are written in, in YAML to make things nice and readable and configurable and flexible. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, so I described it a little bit here. You can um, kind of take a, take a look at that and see, see if you like things. And then in the instructions, I have, you know, a bit of stuff. You don't have to go through it in, in detail. It's really as much as you want. But I do suggest, you, you know, you take a look at the ResNet code because I don't think you've seen ResNet code yet this week. So you can kind of see how it looks in Keras. It's a bit more complicated than when we define a sequential model and just added layers. So it's more complex than that. Um, that's probably somewhat obvious. You can take a look at how things are set up in the optimizer, how I wrapped the thing in the Horovod optimizer, but you also already saw that on the slide. Um, you can look at the main training script and kind of identify the key points that I mentioned on the slides of where we do, you know, Horvod in it, where we uh, put in that callback to do the, the initial broadcast and stuff like that. Um, we have these config files. So again, I'll just show you the, these YAML files. This is just a really nice way to kind of configure your um, deep learning in general. You can kind of define things nice with a nice hierarchy here. So if you want to tweak things for these models, you can come in here and change, for example, the learning rate. You can change the learning rate scaling. If you change this to SQRT, then my code will interpret that as, as square root scaling and so on. Okay. Hopefully it's all self-explanatory, but um, uh, we can, of course, answer questions as they come up. Um, and then I say, you know, you can try to run a single node job. Um, you might want to change the number of epochs before you do that. Just maybe set it to one so you can see really just see how slow it is. Um, this actually, I fixed this, so this bullet is irrelevant. You can ignore that now. You don't have to worry about running a multi-node job right away and then trying to download the data. It, it, it's, it's safe now. Um, and then I suggest that you try the multi-node thing. So you can take a look at these scripts. Um, basically, we, we just made it very convenient so you can run a very, very simple command on the command line. But um, if you look at those scripts, that's where it's actually going to do that s run command. To, uh, to start up the training. So Cypher ResNet. Uh, I mean, they were just loading the software. This is actually the thing I added that makes it safe. So it'll make sure the data is downloaded before it launches all the processes. Um, and then you just do something like this. So S run Python train, config file, and you're off. OK, so um, that's all I have for you. You can try these out. Question? Yeah, yeah. So we're running on KNL, and we're going to do one rank per node. In this case, yeah. Yeah, I guess, yeah, you could. So you could actually do it even without touching the script, but just at the command line instead of S batch minus capital N eight. Yeah, but I do have a fixed kind of like number of threads configuration. You, you know, in principle might have to adjust that too if you're going to. Um, although what I have is probably actually not optimal. <clears throat> okay, so you'll run things and you'll get, you'll start to see these log files. Actually, one thing I can do is I can show you like the last log file that I ran. Uh, so where am I? Here. Um, so if I look in logs, oh, uh, I just checked this one out so I don't have logs. Let me go to the one where I was actually working before. What is it? School. Oh. Q 
You what? Um, yeah. Oh. Well, it's okay. You'll, you'll run it. You'll see the log files. <clears throat> I can submit one now, and then we'll start to get one. How do I do that? Scratch. Let's do eight sci-far ResNet. Um, this is okay. It says available in 48 days, but hopefully that's not really okay. It's already running. So since we have a reservation, you shouldn't have to wait in the queue. It should start right away, unless there's somebody in here who's not nice and submits a thousand node thing and uses the whole <laughs> reservation. Okay, be nice. We do have a thousand twenty four nodes, but we have to share them. So start with eight. Or one or eight, okay. Um, then a little later, you can you can try more. Um, I mean, if you try like 128 with like just the settings that are here, it might not converge. Again, it's a simple problem. Sci far, it doesn't scale that well. It's hard to really do really large scale. Um, 32 nodes, you should still get decent convergence, and it should be fast. Okay, let's start with eight. Um, so let's see if I have anything in the log file yet. Um, not really. Using TensorFlow, so it's it's at least running. But you'll start. To, oh, there we go. You start to see it saying, "Oh, initialize these ranks." It's going to print out some stuff, and eventually it'll start printing out the training. You know, um, you're not going to see the progress bar like we had in in um, the Jupyter notebooks, but it'll say epoch one, and then it'll print out the loss validation loss, and at the end it should say, "This is the best validation loss I got." Okay, so. We have 45 minutes, so feel free to play with this, have some fun, try other examples, talk to Ben if you want to uh, do some hyperparameter optimization examples. Okay, this reservation ends at three something. Yeah, yeah so it's not going to be up for that long. <laughs> so hurry up, run your stuff. Okay, so some people are having problems with uh, running this script. Hello. Yeah. So the so the problem the problem sorry, let me close. So okay. So so the the problem is because you um the problem is because if you go in via Jupyter, it doesn't actually make this scratch directory where it's trying to save the files. And that's because these are all fresh accounts and the fresh accounts they don't make this directory until you log in. And obviously logging in via Jupyter doesn't seem to work in Teams. So if you just um if you have a Mac well, how do I get out of this? So if you have a Mac, you can just open a terminal. You know, I like uh, using the terminal program. Uh, you know how to do that? Lo open a terminal and just SSH into. So let me, let me, S Steve, I don't know how to operate your computer. Like, how do I, <laughs> how do I get this thing to not be full screen? What? Th this thing, how do I get it to bugger <laughs> off? Do you want to move something else there? Because it's yeah, just I just want to display. show them a terminal to it's just the yeah. other display. So we just drag <laughs> this over. That's all. I'm trying to be too clever. Um, let's give you a new one so you don't show all this. Okay, I can just do it. Yeah, make it a bit bigger. Then. Big enough. Yeah. Okay, everybody see that? So, if you are afflicted with this missing scratch directory issue on Cori, you can test that. By doing what are you going off for now? ls scratch. That's an environment variable, just like so dollar sign and then all capitals scratch. Um, if you don't see anything in there, if it says doesn't exist or whatever, then you are afflicted by this <laughs> issue. So if you just do a normal SSH onto Cori with your training account, it will automatically create the directory, and apparently that's the only way to do it. So to do that, SSH your uh, your username first, train one two three whatever. Oh, that's way easier. <laughs> Are you sure? So well, we don't. We, we have to test that. Let's, let's so you might just be able to do that. <laughs> yeah, so you, yeah. Try that. You can also just try that. But um, somebody who hasn't um, 
done the terminal thing yet, try this and then let us know if it works. Just, it worked? Okay, great. And okay. did you have to type in your password in that case? No. Okay, so easier oh, right. instructions. That's, that's great. First thing yeah. from the terminal, SSH, thanks, thanks Corey, yay. <laughs> you can exit then if you want, then it's all good. I think it might be related to the kind of model compilation it's doing. Um, we're not running TF 2.0 in this hands-on. We're running the old TensorFlow. So it's not all dynamic, eager, eager. It's doing some like compilation of the computation graph and then we run it. Um, so it does produce some extra stuff for the first epoch. Um, but at eight nodes, I was getting, you know, like 30, like this, 30, 30 something, 36 seconds per epoch. But the first epoch here, here I had 180 seconds for the first epoch. Okay, so we're not really gonna have any sort of tie up of this hands-on. I think in a little bit, Mustafa's gonna have some uh, uh, closing words for the whole school. So stick around and still, if you have issues, raise your hands, okay? <laughs>